Presentation of dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. A challenge to the state's new redistricting plan, a murderer faces the death penalty, and election day is at hand for Idaho cities. We're talking about news around the gem state. Join the conversation. Dialogue is next. Hello, I'm Joan Cartan Hansen. Thank you for joining us here on Idaho Public Television, on the World Wide Web, and on public radio stations. And welcome to our first edition of Dialogue's Reporters Roundup. We've brought together five of Idaho's best reporters to talk about the big stories of the week. Joining me in our Moscow studio is Bill Spence from the Lewiston Tribune. Bill, thank you for being here. Thanks, Joan. In our Pocatello studio is Sven Berg from the Idaho Falls Post Register. Thank you for driving to Pocatello. Appreciate it. Hey, thanks for having me. And joining us from the College of Southern Idaho campus is Ben Botkin from the Twin Falls Times News. Ben, thank you for being here. Thank you, Joan. And with me here in Boise is Jamie Gray of KTVB. Thank you for being here. Thank you. And Greg Hahn, our new host of Idaho Reports. Not new host, but new, new full-time full host. Full host. I had to host. come all the way down the hall. Had to come I'm happy to be here. And I appreciate you doing it. <laughs> And of course, we want to hear from you. Give us a call here toll free at 1-800-973-9800. If you have a suggestion or an idea about a big story in your part of the state, give us a call. Let's jump right in. I think redistricting is the first one I'm going to touch on. And Ben, actually, we're going to throw it to you first there in Twin Falls because your <coughs> county and city officials are thinking of challenging the state's current redistricting plan. Correct. Tell us about uh, it. What, well, for starters, uh, it's kind of a new scenario for Twin Falls County uh, with the outcome of the new plan. Uh, splits the county into three different parts. Uh, for Twin Falls, the city, you have its own district. And, and that's, uh, forgive me, that's District 24, right? Correct. Under, under the current plan. And we actually have a graphic of that, so if you want to, we can show you that eventually. And I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, and, and then the uh, other part of uh, uh, the county splits that are perhaps more contentious are uh, the part that takes rural Twin Falls County west of uh, U.S. Highway 93 and puts that with Owyhee and Elmer counties. And uh, then there's uh, the other district that uh, puts uh, rural uh, eastern Twin Falls County in with uh, Cajun and Power counties. So is the Cajun and uh, Power County District 20, which would be the proposed 25? Uh, that would be uh, the uh, proposed District 27. 27. Actually. Okay. Okay. So you. So you. What don't they like about the way it's split? Uh, the general consensus is that uh, they feel that Twin Falls is uh, Twin Falls County's uh, influence is diluted. Essentially, having the county split too many ways and uh, lumped together as different parts with other counties rather than uh, being a larger more dominant parts of a district. Now, Greg, you had a chance to chat with the commissioners. They really expected to be sued at some point. Oh, absolutely. I think every, uh, that's what Benny Sirsa told him at the start. When he told him <laughs> at the finish, you're going to get sued. Uh, he just didn't know where it was going to come from. And the Twin Falls one was interesting because there was a Twin Falls, former Twin Falls Republican legislator who was on the commission, Randy Hansen, and helped draw those lines there. But it is different than the Twin Falls. I actually listened in a little bit during the, their hearings, and then I heard the Twin Falls uh, folks up there, and they did want to just kind of consolidate their power. The problem, I think, from the district, from the commission standpoint, is they just didn't have enough people in Twin Falls to make it a two full districts. So if you split the city in half, uh, you could you'd maybe have to cut into a little bit of nearby counties, and then they'd be the ones who are upset that the county was split. So that's kind of what the the problem the commissioners said you have everywhere you turn. Now, I, I know that, that, Bill, you don't cover it necessarily, but, uh, and Sven, you don't necessarily, but the, have you heard any rumblings in your part of the state, either part of your state? Uh, Bill, have you heard anything up north? Anyone else? No. Um, one of the local uh, Republican committee chairs, uh, I talked with him. He said he has not heard anything in this area. Um, the, redistrict, the new redistricting plan, uh, uh, combines Latah County with Benoit County, uh, combines Nez Perce County with Lewis County, and then it creates a new 
monster district that stretches almost from uh, Coeur d'Alene all the way down through Shoshone, Clearwater, and Idaho County to, to the Salmon River. And, um, but uh, I have not heard that, uh, that people are upset enough that they might sue over it. The, I guess I gather the wire service has reported that the Kootenai County Republicans, I think, were trying to get their county commissioners to sue, but that it was kind of just sitting out there and we don't like it, never, never land. Anything, any rumblings of anything in eastern Idaho, Sven? You know, not that I've heard. Uh, it could very well be happening, but I, I just, to this point, I haven't heard anything about it. Uh, that doesn't mean it can't happen. People <laughs> can get upset about these things pretty quick, as I guess we all know. Now you had a chance to interview the commissioners, and we do have a bit of uh, tape of talking about the commissioners. Let's go ahead and take a look at what the commissioners had to say about this particular process. People make a difference, and uh, we just had some incredible individuals who uh, I think put the job they were trying to do in front of anything. They put the Constitution of the United States, they put the Constitution of the state of Idaho, and the oath they took to both of those constitutions first before anything else. And I think the voter will like what we've done because it will make voting easier. We work very, very hard to keep cities and towns together in Idaho. They'll know where their precincts are, they'll know where their voting place is, instead of having it all gerrymandered around to where heck you don't know who you are or where you are, but it's time you get there. There'll be an inevitable lawsuit. Nobody, you can't keep everybody happy. You knew that going in. You've said it many a time, and, and, uh, but you did the best for the citizens of the state of Idaho. That was your charge, and I, I think you accomplished it in spades. I was teasing a little bit like Larry the Cable Guy, but you did get it done. Too many of these people over here, this, they get the marble dust in their, in their head, and they think that everything to do is engraved forever. And you know, In 10 years, it'll be... A, <laughs> the, waves, the waves of the rising tide will wash it away and in 10 years there will be another commission that will make a new plan and somebody will be sitting in this chair and you'll have a lot more gray hair if you have any at all and uh, they'll be telling you that this is the best plan that was ever made. No one has ever done one quite this good. So, so well, you, it's nice to see you actually still have your That's hair. That's right, at the moment. I will say two <laughs> things about, about, you know, kind of watching the tail end of this and and talking to those guys, they really did, they really, first of all, they really did like each other. I mean, the six people, they didn't all know each other. They kind of thrown in after the first commission fails and everybody expects it just to be even worse. And uh, Ron Bottlespacher and Dolores Crow just hit it off in this crazy way. And there was a, mo you know, and really kind of genuine affection at the end of this. And, um, and, and they really, I think, the reason that they all got along so well is they just didn't actually look at the existing map. They said, let's t actually separate this out. What actually makes sense? Where do we draw a line around here so people know if you live on this side of this major artery, you're in one district. If you live on that side, you're in another. And that was sort of their driving force. And I think that's partly why they drew that Twin Falls district separately. I mean, you have a city that's just perfect size for its own district. It made sense to them to draw up its own district. Um, and then try to group the rural folks in with all of the rural folks. I mean, the problem in Twin Falls is then you end up with, from the Twin Falls County guy's perspective, is they're in the minority in two different districts and don't have any say in the city. Um, that said, I know that having a city district gives the, the minority party hope because they think, well, there, there's a chance in these urban areas, even you know, in places that seem con traditionally conservative, Twin Falls, Idaho Falls, some of these other places where they can make inroads. Ben, do you think that that is this a is this a challenge coming from the Twin Falls commissioners? A question of they don't want to give the Democrats any 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 chance at all of getting the district, or is is that the politics of it, or is uh, that could be uh, some motivation? But I think more than that, uh, I mean, some of the local Democrats I've talked to have acknowledged that hey, in Twin Falls County, no matter how you draw the lines, you're still going to have an uphill battle. Uh, I think their uh, concern is more with. Uh, smaller parts of the county being lumped with larger population centers outside the county. Yeah. Now they have not actually filed the suit yet, correct? Uh, not the last that I've heard, no. Okay. So we still, we're still going to be in limbo for a little bit. Uh, one thing uh, that's still kind of in limbo, let me move on to Paul Ezra Rhodes. That's for you, Sven. And um, the 
Paul, could you tell us who Paul Ezra Rhodes is? He's our inmate on death row. Coming up for well, Paul Ezra Rhodes was the uh, he's the guy that, as you say, he he was uh, he's on death row. Um, he just recently was given a date uh, for his execution. It's November 18th, and uh, what what it was that led to that uh, to his his death sentence was the uh, a, a series of robberies, rapes, murders back in about a three week. Um, span back in about in 1987 and he was convicted on a number of those in 1988 and in in pretty short order honestly was uh, was sentenced to death then and now and now has been on uh, death row uh, challenging his uh, his death sentence for uh, nearly 25 years and now what are the odds of them actually going through with the with the execution you know, I mean, obviously that's a tough one to call. This would be, if I recall correctly, the, uh, the first execution in, in the state of Idaho since 1994 and only the second since the 1950s. So obviously that's difficult to say. My, if I had to guess, I would say it'll be pushed back uh, somewhat. Okay. These things just always seem to happen whenever the courts get involved in things. And Jamie, what have you covered in this? Well, just looking at what the, the prison is actually prepared to do, because as he just mentioned, 1994 is the last time that there was an execution. That was also lethal, and also lethal injection. And then before that, in the 50s, that was a hanging execution. So, and the 1994 uh, execution was also a voluntary execution. So this is, this is pretty big for the Department of Corrections. And of course, right now they're working to make sure that they have everything in line for this execution date. They, of course, have uh, built a new execution chamber and with the expectation that this may not be the only execution to happen over the next few years, there's the potential that there could be a couple of others here in the next three years or so. And so they've built this new chamber um, and they've given us some photos of what that's going to look like in, in the viewing room. So they're, they're definitely getting prepared. They've already moved uh, roads to a different location. He's on 24-hour suicide watch at this point. And so they, they, of course, are moving ahead that this is going to happen November 18th and getting everything ready. Now, Greg, you had a chance to talk to Brett Renke about this. Let's show the clip from the first, and then we'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about it. It has not been difficult to get people to volunteer to be on the, tr the three teams. As you can see in the, in the policy, we have a medical team, an escort team, and an injection team. And there are certain criteria for all of those individuals. That criteria has been met. Um, the, they are, in, they are in, in a training mode. Actually, there's two of those teams that have been training for over the past year in preparation for this. So uh, it's a matter of, of them understanding that we're going to protect their identity. It's a matter of them understanding that their, their contribution is going to be appreciated. And uh, there are people out there that are willing to, to serve in this capacity. And we found them both in and out of the agency. It's a significant event for our staff, and yet we need to make sure this is not about us. Um, our focus here needs to be on the victims. Our focus here needs to be on the jury, um, the, the process. We're, we're, the, we're the vehicle to carry this out. And the request that we have from Governor Otter is that it be as professional, uh, with as much respect and dignity as possible. So what, how was your view of as, as you interviewed? Uh, the director about this. Well, what I, what I wanted to ask him about was the the difference in the f managing a, the agency and when you're managing the staff and the people in the prisons and and the and dealing with the board and dealing with you know all these folks who are involved, as well as dealing with the inmate population. And when something stops being philosophy and starts being reality, because it's just a very different world. And I and uh, what struck me the most in the interview was how often, and it's, it's sort of a military comparison, you set up, you know, you have procedures and you go from point A to point B to point C and point D and they practice them out and as he says they've been practicing, you know, they've, they've put these guys on these teams early on. Uh, there comes a point, um, and this happened last Wednesday, when the death notice was delivered and they moved the inmate over to the F block where they, you know, so he's basically just a few yards away from, you know, it's going to be in there till, for the rest of the time, but he, uh, the warden then stops being the warden and starts being just in charge of this execution, of this process for the next however many weeks that it takes and, and a deputy warden is assigned. I mean, it becomes an all-encompassing thing. Sven, what kind of reaction are, are you getting from people in eastern Idaho? This was, you know, for 
I, I, I was a reporter covering that area. It was a terrifying time when Susan Mickelbacher died, the, the two clerks died, it seemed like there was a serial killer loose. The community was really in crisis. How, how are things in Idaho Falls, Blackfoot now? You know, one of the things that, that has struck me about that uh, is that, you know, and it, it was reflected in the director's, uh, in his interview there, it just, it struck me that the solemnity uh, that everyone's kind of dealing with this, using to deal with this, and uh, I think on a certain level it's kind of brought back uh, some of those memories, kind of those memories have resurfaced in the people, especially those that were closest to it. I'm sure the family members are going through a pretty emotional time right now, but certainly police officers, uh, investigators, dozens of which were deployed onto the streets just to go and try to track someone down, uh, and it ended up being ended up being roads. But I don't think I haven't. I have yet to find one person who is expressing any kind of jubilation about this. It's a very kind of solemn event, and they recognize, I think, most of them that they believe that this is the right thing to do. It's it's justice being carried out. But definitely, every person that I to uh, that I've talked to about it really pointed out that they were just one of the cogs in the sort of machine of justice uh, that, that made this all, that carried it from the series of heinous crimes that took place in the late winter and early spring of 1987 to where we are today with, you know, a man facing lethal injection within a few weeks. Well, it, and it really is an unusual thing, as we've said twice since the 50s. I mean, in, when the death penalty was reinstated in the early 70s, I think there's been about 12, more than 1,200 executions across the country. Idaho's had one of those. I mean, it's just not something that happens here, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that they kind of want to, they went to a bunch of other states. They said, how do you guys do it? What are the policies are like? And Director Enke said, for the most part, they're pretty similar. You know, you follow the rules that the Supreme Court set down. You follow you know, the kind of procedures that will, that are kind of aimed at the, at the, the witnesses in a lot of ways, the victims' families and the, and in some, you know, and the, the offenders' families. I mean, those, there's one of the reasons they built this new chamber was to separate the viewing room into two spaces so you didn't all have to cram into this tiny little space together. Um, I had been in that old building and it, and it was, you know, it was a trailer. It was literally a mobile home, <laughs> a was, single yeah. wide. And uh, it was not, um, you know, I think that was, part of the motivation was trying to find something that's a little bit more respectable, I guess. Now, uh, Jamie, odds are that it's not going to happen on the 18th, but that's the, November 18th is the date that it's supposed to happen. And I guess you have to, you have to operate on the assumption that that's going to happen. Absolutely. Everyone does, I think. Everyone has to be prepared for that date um, from people that, that will be there, from victims' families, preparing for that, for him, for Rose, for his family, and, and for the Department of Corrections especially, because they're the ones responsible for carrying this out in a dignified way. We had another crime story hit the news. Bustamante, the yeah. professor from the University of Idaho. No, no, Bill, I know you didn't cover this one specifically, but Jamie has been. We'll take it from the Boise side. The documents that relate that relate to the University of Idaho. Tell us which what was released today and what are we starting to learn about through those documents. Well, Bustamante, of course, is the University of Idaho professor uh, who resigned, and then three days later, police say he killed one of his former students, shot her, Katie Benoit, a uh, Boise girl. And uh, we've been waiting on a lot of records. They're uh, trying to just find out email communication that the two of them had. His records, what did the university know about this guy when they hired him? What did they know about complaints that students were making? And, and there was a legal battle over this between the journalists in the state, of course, and, and the school, and just trying to figure out what the school could release on a former employee. It, it turned out Who that was it, dead. I think that was the yes, key point. Yeah. Uh, yes, and it was a test of the public records law in our state. Yeah. And a, a judge did say that the public had a right to know about some of the things that were happening. And so today we received from the University of Idaho a DVD, and on that DVD were 42 hundred files uh, because when I made my request and as all other journalists did a very broad request we wanted to right. see every Everything. email we wanted to see ev every single piece of information we could to know what happened and so we got that I've started looking through them certainly have not read all of it at this point we're still looking at it but some of the key points that we found out was 
just how the complaints were filed. Katie had made complaints to the university. The university investigated, warned her that she, uh, her safety may be in danger, and she needed to watch out. And some of the other things that came out were actually about Katie Benoit. And we learned a, a little bit more about her. We learned that she had, had told investigators that she was bipolar, as, as we knew that Bustamante had been. And uh, just a lot of the conflict that had happened between them with him threatening her with a gun, which is really what was the impetus for her complaining to the university and fearing for her life. We also know that there were other students claiming that uh, there was some sexual misconduct going on uh, with other students too. But again, just a tremendous amount of documentation to go through that the university also had to go through to provide us with. Uh, Bill, I realize that you've not covered this issue, but I did want to just get your opinion. Do you think the university is going to have to make some policy changes as a result of all of this? Uh, I think President Nellis has already indicated that uh, they are reviewing their policies uh, on a number of levels and uh, trying to figure out, you know, could they have done something that, uh, or do they need to do something that uh, uh, would help prevent uh, this type of situation in the future. We're, we're rapidly running out of time and I'm going to jump subjects on everybody because we have city elections coming up in a week and a few days coming up, depending on when you see this program. So any fun and exciting city elections going on anywhere in the state? Any, any up north there in Lewistonville? Um, I can't say that uh, on the Idaho side <laughs> that I'm aware of any exciting ones, but just, just for the sake of uh, adding something, I do have uh, one on the Washington side of the border for a, a, oh, well. maybe the first ever mayoral, re uh, mayoral race in one of the small towns in Whitman County, and one of the candidates is a uh, paranormal investigator. So <laughs> it's, you know, just for interest, it's a, it's a fascinating race. <laughs> now, Washington, now we do, our signal does get into Washington, so we do cover that. He's promised part. to uncover all the skeletons in the uh, oh. city hall. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Well, let's go on to the drinking ordinance in Washington, which seems an appropriate follow to that. Now, there's, there is an initiative on the ballot in Washington State. Yes, it's uh, uh, the second year in a row that uh, uh, there's been an initiative that would privatize Washington's uh, liquor sales. Uh, Washington has a monopoly on the, the sale and distribution of hard liquor similar to Idaho. Uh, Costco is basically funding the, the initiative. It's chipped in about $22 million so far. Wow. The opponents of the initiative have chipped in $12 million, so it's now the most expensive initiative race in Washington history. Um, and last year it got shot down. We'll see whether the minor changes they made in it is, uh, gives it a better chance this year. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. How, okay, well, I, we probably don't have major alcohol and paranormal mayoral <laughs> candidates in eastern Idaho, but Sven, what's going on in your part of the state? Well, I mean, with, as with any local election, you're going to have some pretty interesting races around here. Uh, to me, the most interesting one is just as a spectator in all of this, it would have to be uh, Barbie Ehart is taking on incumbent Tom Halley in the Idaho Falls City, City Council election. Now, uh, two years ago, Barb kind of came out of nowhere, uh, but she proved that she was a really serious candidate and ran a really uh, respectable campaign, taking on a fairly entrenched uh, incumbent in Karen Cornwell and lost, uh, but uh, put up much more of a fight than I think most people expected. So now that she's had two years to kind of get into the system, she's had her name out there, I think it's gonna be real interesting to see how she fares against uh, one of, uh, you know, another incumbent that she's trying to take on. She obviously, I've, in my conversations with her, she's pointed out that uh, she wants to change up her strategy a little bit this time. She wants to uh, maybe soften her tone a little bit. Uh, she has, she, takes a very uh, strong conservative tack and believes that the, uh, the city council in Idaho Falls is just too liberal and is too anti-business in many ways. And, uh, you know, so I guess we'll see how she does. It's hard to believe anything in Idaho Falls is too liberal. Well, I, I think a lot of people would, ag would definitely agree with you, but uh, then it's all in the eye of the beholder. Here, <laughs> a lot of people really complain about our city council being way too liberal. Okay. Ben, in Twin Falls, what's happening in your part of the state? Well, the biggest thing that stands out in Twin Falls is that you've got a lot of interest. You've got uh, a dozen candidates, 13 counting a write-in candidate, running for four different seats. 
all contested wow. for one reason or another. Uh, probably the most uh, novel election you've got going on is uh, there's one race where you have the uh, retired police chief who's running for the first time, and he's being challenged by a 22-year-old write-in candidate whose uh, campaign platform includes uh, uh, making marijuana law enforcement a uh, low police priority. <laughs> so, so that's kind of an interesting uh, one to watch, fun one at least. Uh, former cop against uh, well, you know, marijuana. You know, you, you actually have races. Boise is... I mean, there's some important, there's just a couple of, I mean, there's just not really much happening. Yeah, I mean, there's things to look at with the city council and the mayoral race, although in Boise, the incumbents typically prevail. And in, in this case, Mayor Beater's uh, opponent is a CWI student who we haven't really heard a lot from. <laughs> it, it's... Uh, so that's just that's sort of it, it's going on and, and we're keeping an eye on on that and I mean with city council you've got uh, Alan Sheely is leaving of course and so just looking to see where everything's going to fall with city council we've got people that are campaigning very heavily in town and really putting themselves out there and then we have we have some people that we're not hearing from so much so um, I wouldn't say uh, we don't have any paranormal investigators or <laughs> so I don't know I think I think the big issue here is going to be uh, economic development I, it's the issue on the federal level all the way down to the city so. So it's what's kind of interesting though is Ben Quintana who's running in a probably the only really contest overly contested race against a couple other folks if he if he wins and Laura McLean who I think the statesman had the other day has outraised everyone else she doesn't have an opponent, but has raised more money than everyone else combined in the entire city council races. But if the, the two of them go on to win, half the city council will be in their 30s, Ooh. which is kind of an unusual mix in terms of age. It was, uh, you, know, not, you know, kind of a sign of, you know, kind of Boise being kind of a youngish place, I think, where people are engaged. And, uh, kind of, yeah. Oh, my God. Well, we, ha we have about a minute left, and I did want to quickly talk about our football player, first congressional district candidate. And we have a Ponzi scheme in Rexburg. So Bill, let's let's toss it up to you real quick. Tell us about our, our football player, first congressional district race. Yep, Lewiston native Jimmy Ferris is uh, throwing his helmet in the race, trying to tackle Raul <laughs> Labrador for the first congressional district. Uh, Jimmy grew up in Lewiston, uh, played football for the University of Montana Grizzlies, and then spent six or seven years uh, in the NFL uh, working his way onto the roster for several teams, including the New England Patriots and the Washington Redskins. Uh, did a little bit of sports uh, broadcasting and acting after that, and now he's back in Idaho looking to run for Congress. There you go. And not related, a Ponzi scheme <laughs> in Rexburg. Sven. Well, uh, you know, if, if the federal agency that sued uh, Michael Justin Hoops in, in Rexburg is to be believed, I guess the most shocking thing about this case is not necessarily the fact that there is a Ponzi scheme or that there was a Ponzi scheme over the last four years, but it's that some of the same people who are Darren Palmer's victims uh, in a long-lasting uh, Ponzi scheme in Idaho Falls also put money into, into this, uh, Mr. Hoops's uh, uh, into his scheme and lost a fair amount of it. Um, and on that note, we've run out of time. I want to thank all our reporters for joining us for this reporter roundup. Ben in Twin Falls, Bill up in Moscow. Presentation of Dialogue on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore family's legacy of building the great state of Idaho. Check out our website, like us on Facebook, or follow us on Twitter.